All right, if you have your Bibles with you, if you could turn with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, we'll be reading from verse 33 all the way to verse 46. So Luke chapter 23, verses 33 to 46. Luke 23, verses 33 to 46. Are you guys ready? Verse 33. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they, don't, they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There also was an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were charged, uh, who were hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deed. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtains of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his, his last. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. If you all join me in prayer one more time, Father, we ask that you will strengthen us and challenge us with your word this evening. Uh, on Good Friday, may we truly see why it is good uh, for us to meditate and reflect upon the meaning of the cross. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys are taking notes, title of today's message is Journey to Calvary. Journey to Calvary. Today is Good Friday. It's a day where Jesus was falsely trialed, flogged, beaten, ridiculed, humiliated, and ultimately nailed to the cross to be put to death. It's a day where Jesus, the Son of God, remained on the cross, not because he couldn't save himself, not because he was too weak, but he had to because he wanted to save sinners. It's a day where Jesus took away what we deserved, which was God's wrath in full, so that he can offer us what we don't deserve, forgiveness of our sin, freedom from death, and free access or reconciled relationship with God the Father. During our time together this evening, I would like for us to journey with Jesus on his road to the cross, his journey to a place called Golgotha, or the skull, which is where the word Calvary comes from. Calvary is from a Latin word that uh, came from uh, the original name Golgotha. As verse 33 states, the place that is called the skull is where Jesus ends up being crucified. If you look throughout Jesus' life, as recorded in the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he came, or he was sent from God the Father, from heaven to earth on a rescue mission. He came on a rescue mission to save sinners by ultimately going to the cross. Jesus' journeys, Jesus' journey to, uh, to the cross on Calvary. It was anything but easy and, and a smooth path. Instead, it was a road marked with suffering, marked with ridicule and rejection. Yet at the same time, it was also a road that Jesus had to journey to fulfill God's promise 
and to offer forgiveness and freedom to humanity. As we meditate upon today's passage in Luke 23, even during the last few hours or the last day of Jesus' time here on earth, we see these things, these things taking place. So first, a journey to Calvary was a journey marked with ridicule and rejection. Although Jesus had a massive following, he was trending wherever he was going throughout his ministry on earth, there was a growing number of people who began to reject Jesus and even ridicule him, insult him, threaten him. Some wanted to stone Jesus, as we saw last Sunday in John chapter 10, because they thought he was blaspheming as he calls himself the Son of God. Some claimed that due to his miraculous power, surely he must be of the devil, because he can possibly not be the Son of God or the Messiah. Some wanted to arrest Jesus and were planning to kill him because at the end of the day, in their minds, in their assumption, Jesus was not giving them what they wanted. This is what was taking place just before today's passage in Luke 23 with the Jewish leaders and the people. On Thursday, yesterday, 2000, over 2,000 years ago, Maundy Thursday, as some like to call it, after Jesus is captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, thanks to Judas, who uh, he is now put to trial before Pontius Pilate. Even when Pilate couldn't find any wrongdoing with Jesus, people, the Jewish people, would rather side with the prisoner by the name of Barabbas rather than Jesus. Because at least with Barabbas... He had a track record of leading a revolt against the Roman Empire. And this is what the Jews wanted from Jesus. As we saw last Sunday in John chapter 10, the Jews were anticipating a Messiah to come and lead them to victory over the Roman Empire. And they were hoping that Jesus would indeed lead them to this victory that they had imagined and hoped for. Yet when they realized that Jesus was not interested in dethroning Rome, but rather, he was more interested in dining and hanging out with sinners or outcasts. They concluded that Jesus couldn't possibly be the Messiah that they had hoped for. Jesus, the true Messiah, has come to offer true salvation. Deliverance from sin and death. Yet the very nation that centered their entire history for the arrival of the king couldn't see Jesus for who he was, and ended up rejecting him. Why? Because he didn't quite meet their expectation. Because he wasn't quite what they were hoping for. Even on Good Friday, as Jesus journeys to Calvary, carrying the cross, it was known to be a public event, a humiliating event, where people would spectate from the sidelines and perhaps throw insults all the way to the cross, spitting at him, hurling insults at him. And when Jesus is finally nailed to the cross, rather than remorse, we see the Jews and his rulers mocking Jesus as if they had finally got, as if, if they had finally got what they wanted. Look at me in verse 35. He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. They do not believe that he is indeed the Son of God. The Israelites, the people who were supposed to be God's chosen race, were the ones in the front lines, in the front rows, not defending Jesus, not weeping for Jesus, but rather they were the ones who were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And now we see as he, Jesus is nailed to the cross, they ridicule him and hurl insults at him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself. Jesus' journey to Calvary was indeed marked with ridicule and rejection, not only from the Jews, but also in today's passage we see from the Roman soldiers as well. After Pilate handed, uh, handed, handed Jesus over to the Roman soldiers, they could have executed Jesus in many different ways. They could have beheaded him. They could have stoned him to death. Yet they were ordered to have Jesus go through perhaps the most horrible, painful, torturous, and humiliating form of execution 
reserved only for the most notorious criminals. Crucifixion. And as if the gruesome and cruel punishment of being nailed to the cross was not enough, as Jesus is in agony and pain on the cross, we see in verse 34 that they were casting lots to divide up his garment. They were gambling, placing bets to see who gets to keep Jesus' clothes as a souvenir. Perhaps to keep for themselves on their trophy case, or perhaps to resell to others to make profit. The soldiers had no respect and no regard for Jesus. After casting lots to divide up his garments, we see the soldiers mocking Jesus by offering him sour wine. In verse 36, some say this gesture is interpreted as wanting to just prolong Jesus' suffering a little bit longer by quenching his thirst so that he can suffer a little bit more. And then there was the inscription above Jesus' head that wrote, this is the king of the Jews, in verse 38. This inscription usually signifies the charge against the person being executed to be displayed for all to see. The charge that Jesus was being crucified proclaiming that he indeed is the true Messiah, the king that the Jews have been waiting for. Just like the Jewish leaders, the Roman soldiers also mocked Jesus with the same phrase in verse 37. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. What are you doing? First the Jews, then the Roman soldiers. Now as Jesus is hung on the tree to be cursed on behalf of sinners, one of the criminals also joined in on the action. We see in verse 30, 39 that the criminal was railing or literally verbally abusing Jesus with the same insult. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. And while you're at it, save us as well. They couldn't understand why Jesus wouldn't save himself if he was able. It made no sense to them. If Jesus is indeed the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the true Messiah, then why? Why would he not save himself? And why would he not want to save us from our troubles? Didn't he say he loves us? For them, it made perfect sense that Jesus, who was hung on a tree, was nothing more than a counterfeit, a fake, a liar, a blasphemer who deserved to die. Jesus can't possibly be God because if he was indeed divine, if he was truly the promised Messiah, he wouldn't go out this way. And friends, in all honesty, there are many who view Jesus in, the, in this manner today as well. These views were not of the past, but it's also of the present. Many claim that Jesus was a great teacher, a great prophet, but not a Messiah, not divine, not the Son of God. Yet at the same time, even those in the church who claim to be Christians begin to put all the blame on Jesus when things go wrong in life, don't they? If Jesus is truly God, why isn't he doing anything about so much evil that's going around in this world? Isn't Jesus aware of the hate crimes? Why does Jesus allow COVID to exist? All the discrimination, the violence, the evil, doesn't he care? Perhaps some of us have grown bitter towards Jesus because we feel as though he doesn't really understand how much pain we are in. How much suffering we are going through. He doesn't care about us. He's too busy for me. Our helplessness, our hopelessness, how lost we are. If there's anyone feeling any sort of bitterness or resentment towards Jesus, and if you're tuning in right now by God's grace, I would like to invite you to take this opportunity to look at the cross, to look to the cross and journey with Jesus on his way to the cross. Because despite such resentment, ridicule, rejection, Jesus never backed down 
from going to the cross. His decision didn't change. Jesus didn't back down from going to the cross despite knowing what he will be facing. Jesus was fully aware of what the cross represents. It wasn't just the physical pain. It was a road of rejection, but also the only way to salvation as he takes upon all the wrath and the penalty of sin that people, sinners, that you and I deserve. Not because he is sinful, he is sinless, but still, he went through the cross. Friends, Jesus didn't go to the cross because Pilate ordered for the execution. Jesus wasn't crucified because people demanded him to be crucified. Jesus didn't remain on the cross because, it's because he was too weak to save himself. No. Jesus went to the cross and remained on the cross because he wanted to save sinners like us. Because he wanted to invite sinners to a new kingdom with a new life and a new identity. And the only way was to, was in and through Jesus Christ. This was God's plan all along. How through Jesus he was, he, uh, how through Jesus he will fulfill all the prophecies. And how he will offer forgiveness and true everlasting freedom. The journey to Calvary was not only marked with ridicule and rejection and suffering, but also with fulfillment, forgiveness, and freedom. As I mentioned, even Jesus being ridiculed and rejected and ultimately being crucified, this was all actually part of God's plan all along. Perhaps as they were too busy mocking Jesus, insulting Jesus, and reject rejecting Jesus, they have forgotten of all the prophecies in the Old Testament that were pointing to Jesus' suffering and how that was being fulfilled right before their eyes. Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the King of Kings, who had thousands of angels ready to attack at his command. If Jesus really, really wanted to, he wouldn't even have to snap his finger like Thanos, but just with his words, he could end all the horror. One word from Jesus and all of Rome into ashes at an instant. One word from Jesus and every person getting what they deserve. Eternal damnation in hell. Yet Jesus stayed on the cross. Because he was sent not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Not to condemn the world, but to save the world. We see this in John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, let's be reminded that Jesus didn't stay nailed to the cross because he was too weak or unable to save himself. Jesus remained on the cross and he laid down his life because that was the only way to save the world. Everything that happened on Good Friday, to the very detail, was to fulfill God's prophecy. Starting with Jesus being crucified with two criminals, criminals alongside him. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of, sins of many. And makes intercession for the transgressors. To the soldiers dividing his garment. We see in Psalm 22. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they will cast a lot. This was taking place right before their eyes. And then the sour wine. Psalm 69, 21. They gave me poison for food. And for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. As Jesus is nailed to the cross, these Old Testament prophecies were being fulfilled. And despite the humiliating rejection, the betrayal, and unrighteousness and violence, Jesus was actually in the process of saving sinners through his love, forgiveness, and obedience to the Father's will. If Jesus did indeed listen to the people and wanted to prove once and for all that he can save himself, and come down from the cross. That would mean that there would be no atonement for sin. 
meaning we would still be bearing the penalty for our sin. We see a clear picture of this in verse 44 and 45. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. For three hours, complete darkness, while the sun's light failed, and curtains of the temple was torn in two. As we can see in verse 44 and 45, the sixth hour is equivalent to noon. So from noon to 3 p.m., there was complete darkness over the whole land until 3 p.m., now, whenever we see that there was darkness over the whole land, this is in reference to God's divine judgment. We saw this in the ten plagues in Egypt in Exodus, didn't we? Exodus chapter 10, verse 21, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, and there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. The darkness during the death of Jesus signified God's divine judgment. And his wrath for his people. Just as God had judged the Egyptians, and, uh, which uh, signified by darkness, this is also the very judgment that you and I deserve as sinners. Apart from Jesus' death on the cross, if Jesus backed out from the cross, if Jesus did indeed save himself to prove to people that he is indeed the Son of God, then there was absolutely... Oh, oh, there will be no hope for us. Apart from Jesus' death on the cross, there was absolutely nothing we can do to escape this judgment, escape God's divine judgment and wrath. But because Jesus willingly remained on the cross out of his great love for us and out of his perfect obedience to the Father, all of God's displeasure, all of his wrath and all of his judgment upon humanity was now being laid upon Jesus Christ. From being crucified along with two criminals, to the dividing of his garments, to the sour wine, to the darkness, it was not a coincidence that these were lining up. But it was all part of God's plan. And the prophecies were being fulfilled. As Jesus obediently goes to the cross, Jesus becomes the fulfillment of God's promises. Not only that, not only is the cross marked with fulfillment, but it's also marked with forgiveness and freedom. As Jesus is lifted up on the cross, despite the ridicule, the mockery, and rejection, pain, and humiliation, the first words, the very first words that Jesus spoke was not a curse, but was a prayer for the very ones that were nailing him to the cross. It says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Despite their ignorance, Jesus still had compassion. Jesus still desired to show love and mercy despite their ridicule. Although they didn't fully understand exactly what such evil they were doing in crucifying the holy and righteous one, who was indeed the Messiah and the Son of God, Jesus still cried out for God to forgive them. Jesus still cried out on their behalf. Jesus doesn't fight back evil with evil, but rather, in return, he offers them not only forgiveness, but also true, everlasting freedom by being reconciled with God. Ever since Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, what was once a perfect relationship between God and humanity was now forever broken. Since then, rather than being repentant and sorrowful of our sin, humanity has been trying anything and everything to be the God of their own lives. We saw this in the building of the Tower of Babel, thinking they can build a tower that reached the heavens, and then the building of the golden calf in the wilderness in Exodus, to the various idol worship throughout the history, not only of Israel, but throughout the history of the world. But friends, it doesn't stop there, does it? Even to this very day, even today, many, even within the church, who claim to be followers of Jesus, are divided in our devotion and our allegiance, because we struggle with idolatry. 
We partially proclaim Jesus to be the king of our lives, but then there's the other half. Our fleshly desires which hunger and thirst after our own ambition, our goals and our purpose. We desire a God not to serve, but a God to serve us. There is a war waging with us, within us every day between wanting to surrender and submit under God's rule versus wanting to become, on, become our own. Yet by God's grace, he reminds us that at the cross, Jesus frees us from our sin. He frees us and he reconciles us with God. In that final moment of Jesus' death, as the world darkens, we also see that the veil in the temple, the Jerusalem temple, is torn in two from top to bottom. The veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place in the temple, which signified division between God and man, is now forever torn. However, as the veil is now torn in two, this signifies that the separation between God and man is no more. As Hebrews chapter 9 mentions, so, uh, Jesus, as Jesus became our ultimate sacrifice, no more sacrifice needs to be repeated as Christ continues to mediate, as, becomes our, as he becomes our mediator at the throne of God between us and him. Verse 11, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then though through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, uh, but not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of the goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Friends, because of Jesus, we now have true Freedom, in the sense where our once broken relationship with God that we can never mend is now forever reconciled. And this is offered not only to the Jews, not only to the Israelites, but even to the Gentiles, even to the outcasts, even to the worst of sinners who's willing to admit two things, who they are and who Jesus is. This Reconciled relationship with God is offered to all freely. But those who respond ought to confess these two things, who they are and who Jesus is. This is what's happening in today's passage to the other criminal who is hung next to Jesus, which leads us to our application, our journey to Calvary. Friends, let me ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? Does it mean that we just tune in every Sunday? We sit in every, every service and we read the Bible here and there. We pray before meals and that's what's going to get us into heaven. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Friends, I believe it starts with coming face to face with Jesus on the cross and humbly, humbly acknowledging who you are. I believe Christianity begins when you come face to face with Jesus on the cross and humbly acknowledge who you are. That you are a sinner. That you are guilty and deserving of God's wrath. That's what this criminal was doing. But you can't stop there because a lot of times when you only stop there, you're only filled with guilt. You're trapping yourself. You first confess who you are. But then afterwards, you gaze upon the beauty of Jesus Christ. You confess that you are a sinner, and then you cry out to Jesus, trusting that he is indeed the Savior, the only Savior. Friends, unlike other Gospels like Matthew, Mark, and John, Luke, Gospel of Luke, is actually the only one who goes in depth regarding this exchange between the criminal and Jesus Christ. And perhaps it is to remind us of the simple and beautiful image of God's invitation. Although this man was unable to see his need for a savior all the way up until this point, right before his death, on that day he couldn't deny who he was as well as who Jesus was. He couldn't deny that he was the one deserving of death and that Jesus was in fact innocent. He couldn't deny that he was sinful and Jesus was sinless. Even when everyone was mocking Jesus, ridiculing Jesus, 
rejecting Jesus, this man began to see how it was actually his sin that, was in, that Jesus was indeed crucified for. As the, criminals re- repent, as the criminal repents and looks to Jesus in faith, we see Jesus promising him in verse 43 that he will be with him in paradise in the presence of the Lord this very day. So then what does Good Friday got to do with us? And what are we to make of today's passage? I believe, friends, as we look upon the cross and meditate upon Jesus' journey to Calvary, this is also a reminder as well as an invitation uh, for us to journey with him as followers of Jesus on this road to Calvary. To be a Christian is to openly acknowledge that we are sinners and trust that Jesus is our Savior. And this is not just a one and done deal, but rather it ought to be a daily confession, a daily commitment to follow Jesus. Just as Jesus' journey to Calvary was marked with suffering, ridicule, and rejection, we too will face suffering and rejection due to our allegiance to Christ. It's inevitable. If you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, you will face ridicule, rejection, and insult. John chapter 15, verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus never promised that our journey will be easy and that we'll be, we'll be excused or exempt from hardships and sufferings. But rather, Jesus, Jesus reminds us that we should expect hardships. We should expect to be hated by the world because of our allegiance to him. At the same time, Jesus encourages us that as we journey with him day by day, Despite the suffering, despite the ridicule, despite the rejection, he also reminds us that he will be with us until the very end of the age. He promises us, as he rises again in Matthew 28, verse 20, that he will be with us until the very end of the age. He reminds us that it will, the road to Calvary, the journey to Calvary, journeying with Jesus, will also be marked with his presence, reminding us of his forgiveness, freedom, and fulfillment. Jesus is not asking for us to be perfect. He's not asking for perfection. Because if that's the case, we're all disqualified. We all have failed. There's no hope. There's only one person who displayed perfect obedience. That was Jesus Christ himself. What he is asking for, however, is persistence perseverance, to stay the course and continue to journey with them through thick and thin. As we look upon the cross, it's a gracious reminder that our faith, our walk, our journey is not grounded upon our failures, is not grounded upon our efforts, our perfection, but upon Jesus Christ's perfect obedience. So friends, as we await Easter Sunday, As we look forward to Resurrection Sunday, let's use the cross as a mirror to see our own reflection. As we stand or as we come before the foot of the cross, wherever we are in our walk with Jesus, let's admit that it was our sin or let's admit that it was for us on our behalf, that Jesus remained on the cross. And as we confess our sins unto Jesus, let's also acknowledge that Jesus is indeed the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Savior who has come to forgive us of our sins, to fulfill the promises of God, and to free us from death and reconcile us to relationship eternal with God the Father. Let's pray together.